Welcome everyone to the Royal United Services Institute of Vancouver Island's continuing webinar series. My name is Scott Osborne and I am the president of RUSI VI. Today's topic is based on the book Forbidden Nation, a history of Taiwan by Jonathan Manthorpe. I assume that Jonathan is well known to this audience as he is the author of his other very popular books, Claws of the Panda and Restoring Democracy. We're also very fortunate in having Jonathan uh, spending time with us today as our guest speaker. Jonathan is always popular. So welcome, Jonathan, and thanks for taking the time to talk about the history of Taiwan today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, and, uh, and uh, greetings to all my Rusi colleagues and fellow members. Um, yeah, I, I, I wrote this uh, book on Taiwan in 2005. I did an update, a paperback edition in couple of years later, and then there was a Chinese edition published in 2009. Um, I, I'm going to start by setting out a bit just, of- Just background. before you start, Jonathan, we've got 47 people online, and I want to go through some administrative points to make sure everybody knows how to uh, pose a question. So the country that gets all the attention in the media today is, of course, the People's Republic of China. But what about the country that China threatens to invade? A, I am, of course, referring to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Such an invasion would likely result in a major war between the People's Republic of China and the United States and perhaps other countries as well. China's One China principle says that China has the right to invade a democratic Taiwan, which in their eyes is nothing more than a rebellious 23rd province. It has tried to entice the Taiwanese, Taiwanese people with its One China Two Systems concept to get Taiwan to join China peacefully. But that idea has, of course, recently been shattered by China's recent treatment of Hong Kong, where they also offered their, them uh, one China, two systems. And if that is now shattered, does that leave only invasion for the future of Taiwan? Jonathan is going to give us some of the background history from his book, Forbidden Nation, which is a pleasant read. Uh, certainly, if you're looking at getting one book on the topic, I would recommend that. Uh, in fact, I think he could have entitled his book Forgotten Nation. But before we start, some administrative details. Jonathan is going to talk for about 20 minutes. Then I will pose some general questions to give Jonathan the opportunity to expand on some of the points from his talk. Then we will take your questions from the audience in written form on either the Zoom chat or Q&A features at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please make your questions brief and to the point. I will get to as many of your questions as I can, but understanding there's a time limit, I may not be able to get to all of them based on the time available. And the time available is basically we close no later than 2.30 p.m. But we are recording Jonathan's talk and we will post it to our RUSI VI website for your review later at your leisure, or for those people who are unable to tune in today. So Jonathan, if you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Scott. Thanks. Um, yeah, you've, you've very ably set out where we are today and, and the conflicts there are today. What I'm going to do first is just to uh, set out how we've got here from there. Um, Taiwan has the curse of geography. And as you can see on the map that's up on the screen at the, at the moment, um, it's on the shipping lanes between Japan and Southeast Asia. And from some perspectives, it's the southernmost extension of the Japanese archipelago. Um, from others, it's the northernmost point of Southeast Asia. And it sits on the strategic meeting of the South China and East China Seas. Looked at from China's point of view, um, Taiwan is a strategic barrier to access to the Pacific Ocean for the People's Liberation Army Navy. That and the purposeful misrepresentation of history by the Chinese Communist Party is at the heart of Beijing's claims to own the island and its threats to invade that we have been hearing so much of in the past few weeks. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm gonna give you a brief history of Taiwan so that you have some idea of how we got here from there. Taiwan appeared as an island at the end of the last ice age, about 20,000 years ago, when sea levels rose. Archaeology is still a young endeavor in Taiwan, 
So if there were people already living at that time on what is now the island, it's not yet clear. What is known is that over the next 19,000 years or so, waves of migrants from both Southeast Asia and from Japan found the island and settled there. Maybe, uh, Ross, we could have the other map of the geography of Taiwan. There we go. Um, as you can see from this map, uh, it is dominated in, uh, in its central highlands and mountainous east coast by parallel valleys running roughly north and south along the length of the island. As each new wave of migrants arrived, they tended to drive existing tribes further up the valleys. There was thus a firmly established Aboriginal population when modern migrants started arriving. There are now 16 officially recognized Aboriginal groups on Taiwan and other groups are lobbying to be recognized. The Aboriginal core of the population of Taiwan is important for a couple of reasons. One is that in the last 20 years or so, mainstream Taiwanese have begun to take more and more interest in their Aboriginal heritage. Added to that is the, the, the discovery from DNA studies that 90% of Taiwanese have Aboriginal blood. It is still unclear when people from the nearest areas on the China coast, the provinces of Fujian and Guangdong, first became aware of Taiwan or visited the island. It was probably in the late 1200s, so 80, 800 years ago. And the first credible written account of a, visit, of a visit is 1349. There were settlements of Chinese fishing families and pirates, often the same thing, at that time on the Pangu Islands, which you can or sometimes call the Pescadores, um, which is halfway between Taiwan and China. And you can see just uh, below the lettering Taiwan Straits there. Um, and there were probably similar hidden communities on Taiwan Island itself too. The first European account of Taiwan comes from when a Portuguese trading vessel sailed through what is now called the Taiwan Strait in 1544. A sailor is reputed to have looked out over the island and commented, Ila Formosa, beautiful island. And the name Formosa is still often used. Over the next 50 years or so, Taiwan attracted more and more Chinese and Japanese pirates to the extent that the China's Ming dynasty uh, sometimes launched anti-piracy campaigns against them. Meanwhile, the Portuguese, Spaniards and Dutch were trying to open up trade with both China and Japan, both of which were intent on limiting foreign access. In 1622, the Dutch started building a fort and establishing a base for trade on the Pangu Islands, the Pescadores. Two years later, in 1624, Ming officials put together an armada, blockaded the Dutch in their harbor, and demanded that they leave. Accepting that they were heavily outnumbered, the Dutch conceded and asked if there was anywhere else on the coast the Ming would allow them to establish an outpost. The Ming officials pointed to Taiwan and said they could go there because it was not part of Imperial China. The, the Dutch moved to what is now Tainan, uh, which you can see just uh, two thirds of the way down the island on the uh, Taiwan Strait coast, um, uh, on the Southwest coast and built Fort Zealandia, as well as another adjacent outpost, Fort Provincia. For the next 40 years, the Dutch ran a successful colony at the south end of the island. The economy was based largely on the hunting of the abundant populations of deer and exporting their excellent fur hides, as well as the cultivation of sugarcane and the gathering of various spices. Missionaries of the Dutch Reformed Church followed the same practice as they had in South Africa and other Dutch colonies. They married local women as a way of spreading Christianity. There are still villages in Southern Taiwan where it is common to find people with red hair an inheritance from the Dutch. And there are also still many Dutch words used in Southern Taiwan. One that uh, comes to mind is uh, the, uh, the fish, gray mullet, is called harder in Taiwan, and harder is the Dutch word for, for, for gray mullet. Meanwhile, the uh, Spanish had set up a shop in Northern Taiwan, in now what is Ki Lung, which you can see just to uh, the right of Taipei on the Northern coast there, and at Dan Shui, uh, which uh, is not on this map, but it's, uh, it's at the end of the river, um, just uh, sort of uh, north, uh, northwest of, uh, of Taipei. 
Um, the Spanish fort there, uh, um, Dan Shui, uh, it's called San Domingo. It's still there uh, and it's a museum now, rather a fine one. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was the British consulate. And one of the consuls was, was Herbert Giles, who with other diplomats, uh, with another diplomat, Sir, Way, Sir Thomas Wade, constructed the Wade-Giles system of transcribing Chinese characters into Roman letters, which uh, survived for about a hundred years. It's been superseded now by Pinyin and uh, methods of uh, different methods of Romanization, but their system lasted for a long time. The Dutch expelled the Spanish in 1642, but by that time, events in China were about to sweep all of them away. The Manchu from over China's northeastern borders had invaded and conquered all before them. One of the last holdouts in the south was a Ming loyalist prince called Zhang Cheng Chong. In fact, he was the son of a pirate who had done very well and uh, become a prince. He is better known in English as Koxinga, and he was uh, making a last stand on the South China coast at Kimoi, uh, which uh, is uh, now Xiamen, uh, which you can see just uh, directly to the left of the wording Taiwan Strait. But seeing defeat coming on April the 30th in 1661, Koshinga fled with his fleet and his army and landed on Taiwan near Fort Zealandia and the Dutch colony. The following day, May the 1st, the Dutch garrison in, Pro in Fort Provincia surrendered and the siege of Fort Zealandia began. Zealandia is situated on the end of a spit and it was, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, while it had access to the sea, it was very limited in its access to water, uh, fresh water for drinking and for other supplies. This story is a saga in itself. And for those of you interested in the full story, you can find it in my book, Forb Forbidden Nation. Suffice to say that the Dutch held out for nine months, but on February 1st, 1662, they surrendered. Uh, Koshingo gave them a, 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 all the honors and allowed them to leave the fort with their weapons and to sail away to the Dutch regional center at Batavia in what is now Indonesia. Koshingo died only five months later and his family fell to squabbling over the inheritance. The result was that in 1663, his heirs surrendered to the Manchu Qing dynasty, which in 1684 made Taiwan a prefecture under Fujian province. That sounds a lot more grand than it was. Accounts from the Times say that the governing prefect came over from China, from Fujian, only once a year at most, when the handful of soldiers stationed on the island were rejects who no one else wanted, and the resident magistrates were the target of constant attacks, and they also were not the, uh, the best uh, quality officials. Indeed, there is a saying that from those times, that the Qing officials were subject to an uprising every year and a full-blown rebellion every five years, and that, from the record, is about accurate. Even though legal migration to Taiwan for, was forbidden all through this period, people from China, refugees, I think one should call them, mainly Hoklo from Fujian and Hakka from the border region between neighboring Guangdong, uh, with, with neighboring Guangdong province, continued to seek refuge on the island. And while these new arrivals created pressure for land, the ethnic Chinese were never able to control uh, more than to see that script where the red highway goes down uh, from Taipei to uh, Kaohsiung. Uh, it's really that third of the island that, uh, that the Chinese immigrants control. The rest remained the territory of the Aborigines, most of whom were fierce headhunters and cannibals, and remained so well into the 20th century. The Qing Dynasty made no claim to this two thirds of the island inhabited by Aborigines. The Chinese, the Japanese, excuse me, discovered this in 1874 when they wanted to launch a punitive expedition against an Aboriginal tribe that had captured and eaten some shipwrecked Japanese sailors on the, uh, on the eastern coast. Qing officials told the Japanese what happened in Taiwan's Aboriginal territory was nothing to do with them. And the, the Japanese could uh, deal, do what they liked. The Japanese sent a successful expedition which gathered information and experience that proved useful a few years on. At the same time, the French and the British looking for footholds on the island to take advantage of its 
its strategic position. In response, in 1887, the Qing Dynasty made Taiwan a province and sent a full-time government. He worked energetically to modernize the western third of Taiwan, but it was too late and too little. Uh, for example, he, uh, he uh, ordered the building of a railway between Taipei and Keelung, which is, a, is an excellent harbor. As you can see from the map, it's, that's not very far, but that was the first railway on Taiwan. Um, after the Qing uh, were defeated by the Japanese in 1895, Taiwan was ceded to Japan in perpetuity. But before the Japanese forces could arrive, there was a rebellion on Taiwan by the island's now well-established nationalist population, and the independent Republic of Formosa was declared. It took the Japanese army six months to defeat the rebellion, but uprisings continued for years afterwards, especially in the South. From the start, the Japanese colonial authorities took a very different approach to the administration of their new colony than they did in Korea, where they had mostly military uh, government. They introduced a civilian administration rather than a military one. They started an effective public health regime that wiped out the tropical diseases to, to, the, to which the island was prey. And they built a fine education system that prepared young Taiwanese for universities in Japan. The Japanese also subjugated the, uh, the Aborigines uh, with the judicious use of the machine gun and poison gas, I'm afraid. By the mid 1920s, the island was for the first time under a single administration. And the Taiwanese came to accept and to relish the benefits of Japanese rule. Indeed, there was huge economic uh, development and advancement in that time. And indeed, most Taiwanese still regard the period of Japanese colonialism as a golden age that launched the island's industrial and innovative skills. By the early 1940s, the Japanese were about to incorporate Taiwan into Japan proper and extend the franchise for elections for the Japanese diet to the Taiwanese. Even now, elderly Taiwanese are far more likely to speak Jap Japanese as a second language after their native Munan, which is the language of the Hopo, than they are Mandarin. After the war, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist forces were delegated to take over the administration of Taiwan for the Jap from the Japanese. And the intention of the United States-led Pacific allies was that this would be preparatory to a self-determination referendum on Taiwan. And there is little doubt that the islanders would have voted for independence, but it didn't and hasn't happened because of Taiwan's strategic importance in first the Korean War, and then Vietnam, it was, as many of you will recall, uh, the unsinkable aircraft carrier. The first act of Chiang Kai-shek's forces when they landed in 1945 was to loot the island of its factories and anything else of value. They dismantled them and shipped them to China, many to around Shanghai. On February the 28th, 1947, this abuse led to an uprising by the Taiwanese that was put down with the utmost ferocity by Chiang's troops and it led directly to what is called the White Terror, during which tens of thousands of pro-independence or anti-regime Taiwanese were detained or killed. Uh, estimates of how many were killed vary enormously, but it was uh, at least 10,000 and perhaps tens of thousands. Martial law was declared at that time and it lasted for 38 years. So essentially for uh, until the 1980s, you had a one-party state under martial law. Chiang's forces were defeated by the communists on the mainland in 1949 and fled to Taiwan, where they set up a government in exile called the Republic of China. For a while, Chiang managed to persuade allies like the United States that this was the true government of China. And under pressure from the Americans, Chiang did agree to allow Taiwanese to own land, which gave them access to credit that allowed for the extraordinary economic development uh, that has happened in the last 50 years. If you talk to any of the uh, main um, uh, uh, industrialists or even small business owners in Taiwan now, you'll find that their grandparents were peasant farmers, but uh, the, probably their parents uh, were able to get credit um, on the basis of the land they owned to businesses uh, in the, uh, in the 1960s uh, or so, it was making small household appliances like irons for ironing shirts or um, electric kettles and that sort of thing. 
and then the third generation is operating uh, high-tech uh, uh, industries of one sort or another. But it all goes back uh, to that um, assignment of, of land back in the 1960s under the, assist, under the insistence of the Americans. Chiang died in, died in 1975, and the US recognized the CCP as the government of China in 1978. And it's also broke off formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan at that time. Chiang's successor, his son, Chiang Jingpo, realized that the only way to keep US support was to democratize. Not only that, the demands for reform from Taiwanese was developing to a point where there was serious social unrest and there had to be political reform. Martial law was lifted in 1987 and there were democratic elections for, par for the parliament, the legislative yuan in 1992. The first democratic direct election for president was in 1996. That was between uh, Li Tangwei, who was already a uh, president, Roman Dang president, and his opponent um, uh, was Peng Min Min for the Democratic Progressive Party. Peng Min Min, uh, is a, I know he's a friend of mine, but he, um, he liked uh, Li Chang Wei, they were both students uh, uh, in uh, Japanese universities and they both speak uh, Japanese as their second language rather than Mandarin. In my experience, Taiwan has had uh, among the most successful transitions for democracy of, of the last many decades. In the elections in 2000, there was a peaceful transfer of the administration to the winning Democratic People's Party. But then when the Guomindang won in 2008, there was again a peaceful transfer. And again, when they were defeated by the DPP in 2016. The current president, the DPP's Tsai Ing-wen, won re-election in January last year. Taiwan has also had de facto independence since 1949. And the overwhelming majority of the island's 23 million people want to keep it that way. Polls consistently have shown well over 20, oh, for over 20 years that over 90% of Taiwanese either want to keep their current de facto independence or to seek international recognition of their independence as soon as possible. And indeed, about 75% of people figure that they don't have to declare independence because they are already a fully independent nation. The only people who want some form of political union with the People's Republic of China are a few remnants of Chiang's defeated uh, Chinese army. And that amounts actually in the latest poll to only 1% of, uh, of people polled. The vast majority of Taiwanese, especially the young, do not identify themselves as Chinese. They identify as Taiwanese. Beijing's claim to own Taiwan has therefore no legal, historical, moral, or any other basis. The most that can be said is that for a few years between 1887 and 1895, the Western one third of Taiwan, as well as China, were both part of the Manchu Qing Empire. Thank you. And uh, I will now leave myself open to questions from Scott and then hopefully questions from, uh, from the audience. Thanks for that, uh, Jonathan. That was a great introduction. Uh, you talked about Taiwan's distinct identity. Isn't Taiwan just populated with ethnic Chinese, most or many of whom originally came from the mainland? Why is Taiwan distinct? Well, it's, it's distinct for a number of reasons. Um, one, as I said, um, there has been huge um, intermingling with the Aboriginal peoples over the last 400 years, to the extent that um, uh, uh, that uh, ninety percent of, of the people are, have both bloods, um, but also if in the last uh, uh, what well, now sixty uh, seventy years since uh, uh, since the end since the end of the Second World War, a very distinct Taiwanese um, culture uh, has arisen uh, both during the period of martial law, but essentially afterwards. Um, in the last uh, last thirty forty years. Uh, it's a it's a very very different place from mainland China, um, and it, not least of course uh, because it um, it uh, sees uh, Japan as much more of a uh, cultural model to follow than than does does China. You'd still um, find in Taiwan um, uh, a great deal of attention to um, 
to Japanese models, in, in, particularly in business, but also in culture. Um, the young uh, people on Taiwan, for example, they look uh, 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 towards um, Japanese pop culture far more than they do towards uh, China or even uh, to Korea. So um, it, uh, Taiwan is, is, is its, own, its own culture, but fashioned out of a mixture of Aboriginal, Chinese, and Japanese. And, and that has created a distinct people, in my view. Uh, you mentioned Taiwan was a colony of the Japanese Empire from 1895 to 1945. Yeah, I, and yet I don't think it's well known that at least 80,000 Taiwanese served in the Japanese armed forces in the Second World War, yeah. and also thousands of Taiwanese civilians right. uh, supported the uh, uh, Japanese occupation as advisors yeah. uh, on mainland China. Yet in spite of being occupied by a foreign power, in essence, for 50 years, why is there still some residual affection for Japan and the Japanese people by some Taiwanese? And what's the current relationship between Japan and Taiwan today? Yeah, I, I have several um, uh, Japanese, uh, Taiwanese friends, one in particular, who was actually born in Manchuria because his father was a translator uh, for the, the Japanese occupying Manchuria on the northeastern coast of, of China. Um, he's, he now lives in Vancouver. He's a Canadian, been a Canadian for decades. He was actually a refugee um, because he's a Taiwan independentist. He's a refugee from the Guomindang occupation of Taiwan. Um, but yeah, as I, as I indicated, um, the, the, the Japanese um, dealt with Taiwan very differently from the way they dealt with, with, with Korea. They, they, they sent from the very beginning civilian, um, civilian governors. Um, and remember, this, is, uh, this came, uh, the, the occupation of Taiwan and of Korea, which happened at the same time, they came when uh, Japan was um, beginning its, its imperial period. Um, and these were its first sort of colonies, if you like. And they were experimenting with how to, how to do this stuff that they were seeing that the, uh, the European powers doing in China and elsewhere around Asia. Um, so I think in many ways, Taiwan was, was an experiment um, and they sent civilian governors who um, really treated it uh, as uh, the, uh, they treated Taiwan as an opportunity for, um, for expansion and construction. I think also because Taiwan is an extension from some perspectives, as I said very early on in my presentation, is, is in some respects an extension of the Riku, uh, the Riku Islands with Okinawa and the, uh, the islands to the south of, of Japan. It was easy for them for the Japanese to see uh, Taiwan as simply an extension of their own islands. Um, and so they treated it very differently. Uh, they, they focused initially very strongly on, um, on public health because the place was uh, rife with tropical diseases of one sort or another. And actually, one, that's an interesting thing but it, because it has carried on, public health remains almost an obsession in Taiwan, but it has made them, of course, one of the most um, successful uh, countries in dealing with things like pandemics and epidemics. And we've seen this in the last year or so. You know, here they are, they're sitting just over the water from China and there was um, huge back and forth for economic reasons between uh, uh, you know, Taiwanese working in, uh, in um, China and so forth. And yet, there have only been about 400 cases of COVID-19 in Taiwan and only eight deaths. Um, their, uh, their public health system is second to none. Uh, and they got that from the Japanese. They also got um, uh, economic uh, expansion, particularly the building of factories, the use of, um, of, um, of local resources such as they are. Um, one of the big ones um, is, uh, is camphor. Uh, uh, camphor plants, which was one of the attractions for uh, for uh, 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 European um, uh, imperial uh, expeditions in in the 19th century, because camphor is used to make uh, smokeless gunpowder, um, and uh, uh, so so the, um, uh, the 
temper, temper production went up uh, massively under Japanese rule, but also agriculture. Um, so yes, the, uh, the, they still to this day look back on that period as the time when, when uh, Taiwan really began to emerge uh, as a, a, uh, an, an, economic, um, an economic power. At one point, Ta little Taiwan was the 12th largest economy in the world. It's not anymore, but it, uh, it, I think even at one time it made it up to eight. So um, it really is an economic and an innovative powerhouse. They, um, if you've got a, a laptop, um, the chances are that the, the most of the guts of it came from, from Taiwan. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're an extraordinary, innovative and, and, uh, and imaginative people. And a lot of that, um, they, many of them still think they got from, from that Japanese colonial period. You described the Chinese Communist Party and the Guomindang or Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists as rival siblings, perhaps even brothers, but also as the opposite of the same Stalinist coin. What do you mean by Stalinist coin? What do they have in common regarding Taiwan? Well, they, 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 they both have in common that, that uh, Stalin supported both the Guomindang and the Chinese Communist Party in the early years of revolution in the 19 uh, teens and 1920s. Um, there was no, immediately after the 1911 revolution that, uh, that ousted the Qing dynasty um, and led to a, initially a period of considerable chaos of regional warlords and so forth. Um, uh, Stalin uh, backed uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Guomindang. Uh, he sent military advisors to, uh, uh, to Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and it was only really, I think in the 1930s, uh, late 1930s, that Stalin sort of switched his allegiance to the Chinese Communist Party away from, uh, from Chiang Kai-shek and the Guomindang. And when you look at, and I think what I meant from that was that the, the Guomindang or Chinese Nationalist Party, if you prefer in, in English, um, was organized very much on the sort of Marxist-Leninist lines of the, of the Soviet Union. Um, in terms of their organization, there was relatively little to, to uh, difference between the Guomindang and the Communist Party. The main difference, I mean, early on, um, it's changed now, but early on, was that the, um, the, China, the Communist Party was a good deal less corrupt than the, uh, than the Guomindang. I mean, we, now that's reversed, I guess. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of the reasons why uh, the Canadian um, missionaries, particularly those around uh, Chengdu in, in uh, Sichuan province, when they came across the communists in, in the late 1930s and early 1940s, one of the attractions to them, and, and hence one of the, um, the births of the relationship that we see to this very day, was that the, uh, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party appeared to be a, 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 an uncorrupt um, and, uh, and straightforward group of people um, uh, uh, sincerely uh, intent on improving the welfare of the Chinese people, whereas the, um, by that time, the Guomindang appeared to be a pretty predatory and corrupt body. And, uh, and I think that uh, when, we, when you read the, the accounts of the, uh, the Canadian missionaries there at that time and the, and the Mish kids, their children, that comes through fairly, fairly strongly. But certainly when um, on Taiwan, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's operation on Taiwan was massively corrupt uh, and you know, a big, um, a reason for the support of the Democratic People's Party now, um, or Democratic Progressive Party now, on Taiwan, uh, is um, is the anti-corruption drive. It, it's uh, it's improved dramatically since I first started going there in the early 1990s. What's the significance of February 28th, 1947, or 228, as it is known locally in Taiwan, and why is it yet another historical example of Taiwan's desire? For independence. Well, this is the beginning of, 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 of the white terror that I mentioned in my presentation. What happened was that th this was this was two years after Chiang Kai-shek's uh, army had arrived and looted the place. Um, they did uh, they imposed a, a, a very corrupt 
administration in Taiwan. Um, they'd subjected the Taiwanese people who they despised um, because they had, the Taiwanese people had sort of accepted and been happy under Chinese, under Japanese rule. So um, the, uh, the Chiang Kai-shek's army tended to uh, treat them as, as, as traitors to the Chinese race, uh, even though as we've already seen, uh, the, the people there could not be considered to Chinese in the purest sense of the word. Um, but they were treated really as subjugated people. They were treated as though they were Japanese. Uh, and um, um, this inevitably led to a huge amount of resentment. But they were also, because of the looting, they, the people were finding it hard to make a living. And there was an elderly lady who was selling contraband cigarettes on the streets. She was accosted by, I think, two of the Chiang Kai-shek's police. Um, the, the crowd assembled to try to protect her. One of the policemen pulled out his revolver and I think somebody got killed. Uh, and there was a some mini riot. Uh, and it carried on. The next day, crowds gathered at first outside the police station where these police had come from, but then they moved to the old Japanese governor's palace, which was then being run as a, uh, was the home of the, of the office of the, the um, Chiang Kai-shek's governor, and they started demonstrating out there. The, uh, this was guarded by machine gun posts, which opened up on the crowd, and then the whole so, uh, the whole island rose up in uproar, and um, uh, the Chiang Kai-shek's troops just sort of went around shooting people hither and yon. Uh, then they started detaining people and disappearing people, and as I say, this morphed into um, into what is called the White Terror uh, and into the uh, into the 38 years of martial law. But um, so 228 has become for uh, Taiwanese uh, Democrats and, and, and people demanding political reform on Taiwan and indeed independentists as well. This has become the, the sort of beginning, if you like, is the resistance against foreign occupation. And most Taiwanese then, uh, and even now, uh, regard uh, uh, that as a period, the, the arrival of Chiang Kai-shek as, as yet another foreign occupation. Um, and um, uh, it, it has eroded over the years. The Guomindang now, I think after its last election defeat, is in the process of trying to re, um, uh, uh, redefine itself. Um, it's quite clear to them that they're trying to win um, elections based on the promise of uh, better economic relations with, with uh, the People's Republic of China is no longer a vote winner in Taiwan, but um, that uh, the island and its people are intent on uh, establishing and maintaining their independence, uh, and they don't want any form of political union with the People's Republic of China. On the map here, we can see on the mainland a place called Jinmen Dao, also yeah. previously known as uh, Kinmen and also as Kuemoi. And these yeah. are Taiwanese islands, as well as the one to the north called Matsu. Uh, yeah. And in the island of Jinmen Dao, uh, many of the locals, uh, Taiwanese citizens, conduct a daily commute to, by ferry to work in the mainland Chinese city of Xiamen. Yes. Is Taiwan in danger of being absorbed by default due to mm -hmm. Taiwan's increasingly intertwined economic relationship with the People's Republic of China? And has, mm -hmm. Ch has Taiwan, in pursuit of economic opportunity, not unlike many countries in the rest of the world, Canada included, made a Faustian bargain? That, that, that question has, has dominated Taiwanese politics for probably the last 10 years or so, Scott. Um, and particularly when the Guomindang uh, 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 under Ma Ying-zhou were uh, in power from 2008 to 2016. Um, they pursued a policy of opening up the economy to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to China and many uh, Taiwanese business people moved their production facilities to China as we've seen elsewhere. Um, what is the result has been the same as has happened elsewhere. While uh, 
trade and of apparent economic activity with, um, with the People's Republic of China has increased enormously, uh, that the, the profits from that have gone into relatively few pockets. Uh, Taiwan was, until 20 years ago, uh, less, um, a very equitable place. There was relatively little disparity between rich and poor, very similar to, to Canada in that regard. Um, but the same thing has happened in Taiwan as, as happened in Canada, that, uh, that globalization, uh, whether it involves moving uh, production facilities to the PRC or to other places, has resulted in growing disparity. But um, on Taiwan, it has, has led to very purposeful uh, policies by the, the, the government and indeed by ordinary Taiwanese people to, uh, or particularly entrepreneurs, to uh, uh, um, stop any further uh, dependence of their economy on trade with, with the PRC. And they look particularly to, um, uh, to Southeast Asia. But I think that also, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a lesson and, a, and an opportunity here for Canada. Uh, we are now part of the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Taiwan wants to become a member of that. Um, so does the UK and various other people. But I think that um, it would be uh, a, a, a huge opportunity for Canada to diversify its own um, uh, business dealings with uh, another diplomatic and security and other links with Asia to put far more emphasis on democracies, uh, Asian democracies like Taiwan, rather with whom we share uh, any number of common values, rather than um, with the People's Republic of China, with whom we share very few values. Um, so, um, yeah, they. Um, let me just say a word though about Xiaomen, uh, about uh, Zhang, uh, Kin, uh, Kin Ming, uh, Jin, Jin Men Dao, and the Matsuo. Um, this is a funny anomaly. Uh, because, as you point out, these islands are just off the coast of, of, of China. Um, and uh, people from uh, Kinming in particular do go to, uh, to Xiamen to work and they go there shopping. Um, and these people, of course, are Chinese. They are not Taiwanese uh, ethnically or culturally. Um, and I think that um, there is quite, uh, there, as, as uh, China under uh, Xi Jinping sort of looks to gobble up Taiwan, what it might do first is to try to gobble up these islands uh, and see what the international reaction is. And then if it sees it gets away with that, as it uh, did, of course, as we've seen with, with the creation of military outposts in the South China Sea, uh, then it would feel emboldened to maybe then go on and try and grab the Pescadores Islands, the, the Pangu Islands. Um, and this would you know, tighten the noose around uh, Taiwan and make it easier, for, for example, for um, uh, the PRC to uh, install a blockade around Taiwanese ports and try to starve it into, into submission. Um, as we know, they're very, the, the PRC is very, very capable at salami slicing, at taking uh, little steps which are not enough in themselves to, um, uh, to uh, uh, demand a, a powerful response from the US and, uh, and other Western allies. Um, and, uh, and then they just keep uh, taking another small step and when there's no response, they take another one. So I think, um, I don't see an all, that, uh, uh, a, 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 an all-out assault on Taiwan as something in, uh, likely in the very near future, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if um, Xi Jinping and People's Liberation Army didn't uh, start by trying to uh, take control of Matsu and Xiamen or and of uh, Kinmen, where actually they would probably be welcomed, whereas they wouldn't be on Taiwan or even on the festival. Um, speaking of invasion, what is China's anti-secession law of 2005 and why does it potentially provide an international diplomatic cover for an invasion of Taiwan? Well, this is part of the salami slicing um, and they've, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, we, they've done it, um, uh, this was in part aimed at Hong Kong um, because there is a, there is a, a 
growing independence movement in Hong Kong amongst the young in particular who had grown up since the handover of, of sovereignty of Hong Kong uh, back to China in 1997, um, and uh, who remember nothing of British colonial rule, but consider themselves Hong Kongers. Um, the, the, so Beijing was in part reacting to that. Um, but also, they're, they're very adept at, at uh, introducing these, uh, these laws, uh, domestic laws, which um, seem to have no relevance at all. But then uh, all of a sudden, you find them uh, applying them uh, uh, in, uh, in really very um, insidious ways. Um, so, you know, uh, for example, we've heard recently that the new security law in Hong Kong um, is, uh, is uh, that there, there's a threat of them applying it to uh, people abroad. So anybody, for example, in Canada who uh, advocates um, uh, for democracy in Hong Kong, if they want to go to China, they may find themselves arrested. Or if they're a serious enough threat, they might find themselves you know, hijacked from a hotel in Bangkok or in Cambodia which has been done by, by Chinese authorities in other cases. And so this just sort of lays a, a paper trail, if you like. Um, Taiwan is independent, but um, uh, if there may come a moment where uh, China will, uh, where if, if the outside world, say led by the Americans, tries to interfere in, um, in uh, uh, Chinese activities or PRC's activities uh, regarding Taiwan, where Beijing will say, ah, oh, but this is, this is simply um, our domestic legislation. We are simply applying domestic legislation and you mustn't interfere in the internal affairs of China. So it's, it's just sitting there and um, one day it may be useful for them, um, but it's worth keeping an eye on as you suggest. Do you have any final thoughts about uh you've touched on it, about the fate of Taiwan in the future. Yeah. Well, you know, my hope is that they will be able to sustain their independence. They're a, they're a very tough, plucky people. I've, I've been there many times and uh, I've grown to admire them tremendously. Um, they, as I said in my introduction, they have constructed in really 30 years or so, um, what is, in my view, one of the most vibrant uh, democracies in Asia, maybe the most vibrant, I mean, compatible only with, uh, with South Korea and uh, Japan, although there's, a, <laughs> there's always a debate about what sort of democracy Japan is. Uh, but you know, Indonesia is a, is a vibrant democracy, but there aren't many others. I mean, I've been through and reported on transitions from authoritarian rule to democracy all around the world. And Taiwan is without a doubt, one of the most successful that I've seen anywhere. So, you know, they, they are a natural ally for us who we should support. Um, and that in the end, of course, comes down to how are we going to deal with the People's Republic of China? Um, and are we going to uh, allow it to uh, overrun democracy. And I don't think that we in Canada or indeed other allied Western democracies have yet really come to terms with how we approach uh, the People's Republic of China as it becomes the world's largest economy and potentially in the next 30 years, perhaps the world's leading superpower. I think these are things that we need to start thinking about and, um, and preparing for. Um, and uh, uh, we're not doing it at the moment, but we darn well ought to be. Um, finally, before we get to the audience uh, questions, can you tell our audience a little bit about how your book Forbidden Nation came about and, and its impact, its receipt, if you will? Yeah. Um, it, it came about, uh, I first went to Taiwan where just uh, shortly after um, Chiang Kai-shek died. He died in 1975. I was there, I think, in 1976. Um, it was still under martial law and it was a one-party state. I had never been to a place like that before. I was working for the Toronto Star at that time. I was, in fact, writing a, 
column on uh, Ontario uh, provincial uh, political affairs. And this was my one of my first outings as a foreign correspondent. I went on to Hong Kong and then to southern China. Um, and I found it a really intimidating place. They didn't, as you can imagine, like foreign journalists. Uh, and it was just really horrendous. Um, I went on to Hong Kong, as I said, and then in southern China. There was, in terms of atmosphere, there was no difference uh, between Taiwan and southern China, which of course was also just a, a period after the death of Mao Zedong. Um, fast forward, I, I then went to Europe as a foreign correspondent for the Star, then uh, uh, on to Africa for Southern News. And then in 1993, I came back to Asia as the Southern News correspondent for Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, based in Hong Kong. Fairly soon after, I went to Taiwan, um, probably 1994, uh, and it was a different place, totally different place. It was a, it was a democracy. They hadn't yet had, or they were just coming up to having um, the first free and fair uh, uh, presidential elections, but they'd already got a democratically elected parliament and so on and so forth. Um, and the atmosphere was different. Uh, the, uh, there was a lively, intellectually challenging, culturally exciting place. And I thought, what the heck happened here in a really relatively short period of time? And so I started looking for, for books and for um, material on to describe the last 20 years or so uh, in, uh, in Taiwan. I couldn't find any. And so I thought, well, maybe I'd better write one. Um, and that was how I sat down and wrote it. It was uh, taken up by Paul Gray Macmillan of New York, which is an academic publisher. Um, my, this book, Forbidden Nation, was actually one of their first forays into uh, uh, having non-academic authors and uh, it was a bit of a learning curve for me too. But the result is that it was taken up um, when it was published in, in 2005, it was taken up uh, both by American universities and by universities in Taiwan as um, uh, for their political science courses. And the reason for that was that it was really the first um, non-polemic, non-ideological history of Taiwan to be published since the end of martial law and since the introduction of democracy. Taiwanese authors themselves hadn't got around to it yet because what you could say and what you could publish during the period of the Guomindang one party state uh, was limited entirely to the official uh, view uh, of from uh, Chiang Kai-shek's exiled army uh, and officials that Taiwan was part of China um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so my book was, was sort of gobbled up by uh, universities on Taiwan and it's still used, but I've, uh, and I've been many times to give talks around it and I find it a, a rather strange, uh, particularly early on, that Taiwanese students of domestic um, political science had to be able to, to read English and uh, Thankfully, now many more books have been produced and they can, uh, they can study in their own languages. But uh, this really was, um, uh, for some years, the, the first sort of non-ideological book on the history of the island. Uh, I got a question here from Bill Roach. It's a long question, mm -hmm. so I'm going to just shorten it a little bit. Uh, could you comment on, on any current alliances between Taiwan and other Pacific democracies, such as the United States, Canada, Australia, etc.? Uh, what are the likelihood of any of these com countries coming to Taiwan's aid in the event of an attack by China? And could you speculate whether you think Canada might be drawn into such a conflict? That's really probably about three questions, but. Yeah. Um, well, there are, there's the, the main formal alliance is the Taiwan Affairs Act, which is a, a United States piece of legislation and was passed in 1978, just after um, uh, uh, President um, Carter uh, had uh, formed diplomatic or completed the process of forming diplomatic relations with Beijing. And that also involved cutting uh, formal diplomatic ties with Taiwan. The, the uh, US Congress at the time uh, was, uh, was very anxious that this would um, 
uh, precipitate an invasion of Taiwan by the Chinese Communist Party. And so they passed this legislation, which uh, on paper requires the uh, US administration, US president to come to the defense of Taiwan, to come to the aid of Taiwan if it is invaded uh, by anyone, but obviously particularly uh, the, um, by China. Um, the wording, of course, leaves some loopholes and the extent to which a, a US president might come to the aid of, of Taiwan depends on, on their commitment, their circumstances, and I guess on the, uh, the feelings of the American public at the time. I think at the moment, um, uh, and I'm sure Xi Jinping is aware of this, at the moment, the uh, antagonism towards the People's Republic of China in the United States is very high. Um, and um, there is a good deal of, of political support for Taiwan uh, in the US at the moment. So I think that, um, that it's unlikely that, uh, that Xi Jinping would, would uh, risk a, uh, an attack at the moment. Um, there's also a, a, a good deal of, of sort of under the surface support for Taiwan uh, um, from Australia um, and other Southeast Asian countries. As I said, ta Taiwan has been investing in businesses in uh, many places in Southeast Asia and there's strong support there. Singapore uh, has strong support for Taiwan. Singapore has such, uh, Singapore's territory is so small that it does most of its military training on, on Taiwan. Indeed, uh, all Singapore's you know, jungle forces do that. They do all their jungle training in Taiwan. So there's a there's a strong strong uh, link, uh, military link there. Um, uh, Japan also has uh, strong just sort of just under the bed covers ties with Taiwan, as I've indicated. And um, I think that uh, uh, Japan, perhaps even more than uh, the United States. Uh, keeps a very, very close eye on what um, the, the, uh, the People's Republic of China, mainland China, is up to over Taiwan. Uh, Japan, I think, would almost certainly um, come to, uh, to Taiwan's aid if there was any uh, direct threat, um, uh, because I think Japan is, um, is wondering now how secure its alliance is with the United States. Uh, particularly since the Trump era, and we don't know, you know uh, what is going to happen in the future, but there's a strong possibility that these sort of isolationist trends in, in the US will continue in one way or another. So Japan in particular feels quite isolated uh, and is looking for allies like Australia um, and countries like, uh, like Taiwan and indeed India and others. Uh, would uh, Canada get sucked in? Uh, I mean, I, that's very hard to say. I think um, you know, we, uh, it, it would not be, I think, as things stand, it would not be a NATO operation, which would be an obvious doorway through which we'd march. Um, and, did, and, and, and whether the UN would be involved is another matter. That would be probably the other trigger for Canadian involvement. So at the moment, I think I find it hard to see a scenario where Canada would get involved, but um, you know, uh, who knows? Who knows? Uh, uh, 20, 30 years from now, um, time goes a lot faster these days than it used to, and uh, and situations change much more rapidly uh, than they have uh, than they have in the past. So uh, who knows what the world will look like from the Canadian spectrum in five or ten years' time? Okay, the next question is from Alex Greer. And uh, something you didn't cover, at least I didn't hear you uh, cover it, but uh, what is the religious makeup of the Taiwanese people? Mm -hmm. Oh, everything you can think of. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I mentioned the uh, Koxinga, the, uh, the Ming nationalist who, uh, you know, son of a pirate and he became a prince. There are 60 temples uh, to uh, Koxinga on Taiwan. Um, and that's sort of Taoist you know, um, ancestor worship. But there's a very, very strong uh, Buddhist um, representation on Taiwan. I, I would 
most I would think are, are Buddhist or Taoist. Um, but there's also a very strong Christian heritage. Um, the uh, the uh, Presbyterianism, in fact, was brought to Taiwan by a Canadian missionary um, who's still very revered in Taiwan. He, he introduced the first girls high school on, uh, in Taiwan. He, he, um, uh, he arrived actually at, uh, at uh, Dan Shui, as I mentioned, up on the, on the coast um, uh, just by Taipei. Um, and um, there's, uh, there's a statue of him on the docks. It's not a very good representation of him, but it's there. Um, and uh, his school, in fact, became, um, became a both sexes school a bit later. And um, uh, Lee Tong Wei, who was the president, he went to that school, the, the you know, Canadian founded Presbyterian high school. And I think Lee Tong Wei still uh, uh, calls himself a Presbyterian. So there's, there's a bit of everything. Um, and then of course, amongst um, the Aborigines, there are all kinds of, uh, of um, animist and, and other spiritual um, uh, commitments. So, so it's, it's a bit of everything. There's a, there's a, there's a fair Catholic uh, representation as well, because um, one of the few um, nations, states, that uh, still has full diplomatic relations with, uh, with Taipei uh, is the Vatican. Um, and they've, uh, uh, they've resisted all pressure from the People's Republic of China and from the communists to end their uh, recognition of Taiwan as an independent country. So uh, yeah, the Catholics are pretty strong there as well. Uh, question, next question is from Bill Curry. What needs to happen before countries like the United States, the United Kingdom and Canada and others uh, to recognize Taiwan as an independent country? Well, I think, you know, my, my view, I'm, and I admit to my own bias on this, I think that now would be a very good time. I mean, here we are in Canada. I can't, it's difficult to speak for the States and, uh, and, the, and the UK. They, they have their own and really quite different pressures. But I think that, that um, you know, here we are in Canada. We are in the midst of an of a un, unprecedented crisis in our relations with the People's Republic of China. We, we need to stand our ground on that. And one way of doing it would be to uh, extend diplomatic, uh, full diplomatic relations with uh, to Taipei. We already have a sort of secret embassy there with a with a secret ambassador, and have had for many years. But um, but it would be uh, would be fully within our authority under our agreement, our diplomatic agreement with with the People's Republic of China, for us to also recognise. And give full recognition to Taiwan, um, and I think that as as we, I hope, lean more and more on the new comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership as our as our um, lead uh, link to Asia. And if we, I think it would be a good idea for us to uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, join in in lobbying for uh, for Taiwan to become a member and to make. Uh, uh, full recognition of Taiwan and Taipei as uh, as part of that uh, of that membership, um, and I think now would be a good time to do it. Uh, you know, it, it, the in the U.S., I think there's no doubt that Biden is going to have to adopt a very similar attitude towards the People's Republic of China that Trump did because of its popularity amongst the American people. Um, but uh, hopefully, he will do it with a, a sounder basis and more continuity and uh, more intelligent. Um, but it may, it, it, so it could, it's foreseeable that, that the US might move towards, um, towards recognition of uh, formal recognition uh, and the establishment of formal um, ambassador status or relations with, with, with Taipei um, as others. Uh, the British, I don't know. Um, I, the British are, are, are looking to join the um, CPTPP as well, um, and if they and Taiwan did, that might also involve um, uh, formal recognition. You know, the British are increasingly unhappy with the, the PRC because of uh, of what's happened in Hong Kong uh, and clear defiance of the the the, uh, the treaty between Britain and the U.S. over the handover uh, with Britain and uh, and uh, 
uh, China over the handover. So they might, uh, Britain might well feel that um, that uh, uh, offering recognition to uh, to Taiwan was a was a good way of kicking uh, kicking Beijing's shins. I've got a quick, another next question from Lloyd Scallon, and it might be a difficult question to answer unless you're a military planner. Is uh, in the event of an invasion, what would we anticipate the United States and even China do, or correction, Japan do? Yeah. Um, well, you know the um, uh, what I think if, I, if I'd been asked that question twenty years ago, I mean I would have said that. Um, or 20, 25 years ago, maybe a better time frame, I would have said that uh, the US would have taken the lead and it would have sent a few aircraft carrier battle groups around Taiwan. Uh, they would have flown some sorties around the coast um, and uh, uh, they would have deterred uh, any uh, thoughts of an invasion uh, by the PRC. That equation has changed dramatically because in the last 25 years or so, uh, China has embarked on, as many of Rusi members will know, on a quite massive military uh, modernization program. Um, and most of it was initially predicated on being able to invade Taiwan. Um, and the essential first element in that, of course, was acquiring the weapons to be able to deter the US from coming to the aid of Taiwan. And so you see the building of a now massive submarine fleet of something approaching 100 boats, um, uh, and uh, also of uh, missiles, which are relatively cheap and easy uh, um, solution in these situations, including, of course, as we've heard, you know, an intercontinental ballistic missile that can drop down uh, out of the stratosphere onto a uh, onto a, a aircraft carrier battle group, um, and is by definition uh, there is no defence against a weapon like that for for, for uh, an aircraft carrier battle group. But I think um, if one reads the American strategic studies and assessments over the last 10, 15 years, they have uh, um, the Pentagon has come to realize that um, uh, China has created uh, a very effective um, uh, deterrence capacity um, if it comes to that. Uh, it hasn't deterred the US under some circumstances from, from elbowing its way through. We, we read fairly regularly these days of, of folks um, of freedom of navigation um, uh, runs by American warships through the South China Sea, through the Taiwan Strait, and we indeed, uh, Canada has run frigates through the Taiwan Strait on a few occasions recently, and and um, and got uh, condemnation from China for doing so. Um, uh, Japan, Japan, I think, would be more resident in rushing to the aid of uh, of uh, Taiwan in the same way. Um, and I think one also has to consider that depending who was in the White House and what their attitude was towards, towards China, aid to Taiwan might simply be the, um, the provision of armaments. Um, you know, as, as Scott pointed out, I am not a military man and I, I, I'm, I can only bring uh, a certain experience of, of several wars to bear on this, but we all know that a, a seaborne invasion of anywhere, particularly a defended coast, is one of the most perilous and uncertain missions that there is uh, to be taken uh, uh, by any military. Um, and I think that uh, uh, unless they they just blasted the place with missiles beforehand, it's it would still be very very difficult for. Um, uh, the People's Republic of uh, China and the, and the PLA to uh, to mount an attack, uh, mount an invasion of uh, of Taiwan with any um, uh, guarantee of success. Uh, and um, uh, you know, if you if you look at um, politically, I still think it would be quite difficult for um, the Chinese Communist Party to justify an invasion 
to the Chinese people, particularly an invasion that involved huge loss of life because uh, the, the Communist Party has been telling uh, Chinese for decades that, you know, these are their brothers and sisters on Taiwan. These are, uh, it's, it's just a, 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 a rebel province that, uh, that need to be brought back into the family. Well, how you justify bringing it back into the family by slaughtering uh, thousands or more uh, of its people, I really don't know. I'm the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party had the experience of Tiananmen Square um, in, in 1989 of uh, the dangers of um, turning the People's Liberation Army on Chinese people. And uh, uh, they still have not uh, got over that. Uh, the, you know, the, the Chinese people do not trust the PLA the way they used to. So I think that, uh, that uh, Xi Jinping would think uh, many times before launching an invasion of, of Taiwan. It would be a very perilous undertaking without any certain outcome. I think just, just before I go to the next question, just an observation in one of our past issues of the Rusi newsletter, we uh, devoted a fair amount of space to the expansion of the uh, Chinese Marine Corps. Uh, so that's on our website if people want to look at that. Uh, another question from John Azar. Uh, besides democracy, how different is life for the Taiwanese people compared to uh, the mainland? Oh, dramatically. Huh. There's no comparison. Um, no, it's a very open, uh, culturally very vibrant, very lively society. Um, you know, people uh, people have full control over their own lives. Um, it's a uh, it's uh, the 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 level of democracy, even down to very local levels, is is is, is very strong. It is a participatory place, um, and uh, quite apart from that, people also uh, engage in a lot of volunteerism. Volunteerism is very very strong in Taiwan. So yeah, there were, it's chalk and cheese. There's absolutely, you know, if you if you want to look at just at the architecture, um, and you know, just at the faces and just at the at the at the, at the characters, so the the, lang the written language, you can be fooled into thinking that they're quite similar. But uh, but once you just talk to anybody, once you spend two days wandering around listening to people, seeing what's going on. There is absolutely no comparison whatsoever, none. Okay, another question from Awad Sifri. How would, and it's kind of more of a counterfactual uh, than a question, but how would a coalition of countries composed of China, Russia, Venezuela, uh, defending Cuba in case of a United States invasion being perceived? Kind of trying to build a what, what aboutism thing there. Yeah. Do you want yeah. to play with that? Well, I yeah, I have no idea. I um, uh, is this a similar situation? Um, I uh, I suppose one could one could imagine that it that it is in some ways. Um, uh, although, of course, that's been tried, hasn't it? Um, you know, the, the U.S. did try to invade um, uh, Cuba and didn't at the Bay of Pigs and didn't get very far. Um, and then uh, the Soviet Union tried to make uh, Taiwan, uh, tried to make Cuba uh, a, uh, a missile base um, aimed at the US and that didn't go well either. Um, the, 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 uh, the US of course used to have at, uh, during the Korean War and during the Vietnam War, substantial uh, military bases on Taiwan. It doesn't anymore. The, I'm, there are, you know, people in civilian clothes come through and talk to people, sure, uh, but there are no uh, there are no formal military U.S. formal military bases there. Um, how uh, I, I mean, I I wonder if uh, Russia, China, and Venezuela would bother to try to defend Cuba if uh, any. Um, U.S. president decided to try and take it. I, 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 I find it hard to imagine that any U.S. president these days, unless 
Cuba again became a very direct threat to the US and, and Russia or somebody put missile bases on there. I find it hard to imagine that any US president would, would try to, to rectify the mistakes or repeat the mistakes of the past. So um, I'm not sure you know, once one, one gets past the initial sort of slightly similar picture, whether there is a, a strong similarity. In, um, we've got no more questions, so it's about 20 after. So I think we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank you again, uh, Jonathan, for uh, taking the time to uh, discuss the history of Taiwan based on your book, uh, Forbidden Nation. Uh, I enjoyed reading it. Uh, it's uh, fairly straightforward. It's certainly informative. It, um, it countered some assumptions that I had made, which, of course, are based on no knowledge of Taiwan at all. Uh, so I think if uh, anyone in our audience is looking for one book and only one book to uh, read on the history of Taiwan, I would certainly uh, recommend it as uh, something they could look uh, closely at again. So again, uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. And is there any last comments you want to make? Well, I just want to thank you very much, Scott, for the, for the chance to talk about um, a place that I, I have a great deal of affection for and, uh, uh, and, and support very strongly. Um, uh, but. Um, uh, and to thank you know, Rusi members for dragging themselves away from the uh, the trial on TV to, to uh, <laughs> come and take part in this. And so I, uh, I applaud you. Uh, and it's been great fun. And uh, uh, please, uh, you, know, uh, you can get in touch with me very easily as a, as a fellow Rusi member. And if anybody's got any other questions or any other information they'd like or any other pointers, please do get in touch. And I'll be only too happy to, to respond. Okay, and again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and uh, to everyone else, uh, thank you for joining us uh, for Rusi VI's continuing webinar series, and uh, to everyone who participated, uh, have a good day. <laughs>